Hello, my name is Claudia Bigler, and I'm the moderator for this session. We'd like to welcome you to this symposium session, Zinzendorf Challenges the Establishment. Ludwig Zinzendorf embraced piety and dedicated himself to a radical Christian agenda. He so alarmed his fellow Saxon nobles that they banished him from their country. He sent missionaries to North America and the Caribbean. He reached out to Native Americans and enslaved people, established communitarian settlements in Germany, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. He promoted collective family units and founded the Moravian Church as we know it today. He reached beyond confessional divisions counting Cardinal Louis Antoine de Noailles, did I say that correctly? Very good. Noal, and Benjamin Franklin as his friends. In the last years of his life, he cultivated several spousal relationships. This session will explore the many Moravian Mormon parallels. I'll take a second to introduce you to our presenter today before we begin. Dr. Brian W. Kassenbrock studied in the United States and in Germany and has specialties in science, education, and German literature and culture. He has lectured and written on Mormon studies over the last decade. Dr. Kassenbrock. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the Sunstone Foundation uh, for this opportunity to present my ideas. Also, thank you to the New York Public Library, the Haythai Trust, and New York University for access to their collections. Uh, for the special purpose of this occasion, <clears throat> I am waiving my usual speaker fees, and I am sure that at the end of it, you will agree that it was worth every penny. As we look at the, as we look at the unprecedented year, that we have just been through, we may well take this opportunity to look at an unprecedented individual who cha changed the calculus on wealth and power in Europe and the Americas in ways which are still reverberating today. Count Nicholas Ludwig von Sinzendorf und Potterdorf challenged the established norms and values on several continents with regard to race, sectarian strife, gender roles, and social class, and in some ways laid the groundwork for the restoration movement in the United States, which was going to occur over a century after his lifetime. The 18th century geopolitical situation was quite different from today's. What is now one of the world's most populous countries and powerful nations was at that time a backwater of the colonial empires of France, England, and Spain. Germany was not a united country, and important areas in North America and, uh, and in northern Germany, excuse me, in northern Germany, were under control of the crown of Denmark, which also controlled a string of Caribbean islands, including St. Thomas and St. John, uh, which are today American America's Virgin Islands. Tens of thousands of Germans had migrated to the Americas, where they lived in large German-speaking communities, even though Germany had no colonial empire. During the Great War, World War I, the United States government became alarmed at these large German communities and conducted a vigorous anti-German campaign whose effects are still being felt today. Certainly, Adolf Hitler's atrocities did nothing uh, to uh, uh, endear people to German language or culture either. This appreciated Americans' appreciation of Sinzendorf's contributions to history. Americans who are quite familiar with William Penn, Captain John Smith, or any number of lesser figures know nothing about Sinzendorf, owing at least to, in part, to his German roots. One of the aims of this report is to fill that void. In this presentation, 
I will look at Sinzendorf's life, communitarian settlements, and missionary outreach, his theology, and finally, his little known involvement with spiritual wives, which will be the last section, because sex always attracts the interest of an audience. I'm say, uh, saving the most tantalizing uh, aspects to the very end. In section one, I'm going to give a brief I'm going to give a brief account of the biography of, uh, of Count Sinzendorf and with an <clears throat> emphasis on his settlements and his missionary outreach. On the 26th of May, 1700, uh, Nicholas Ludwig von Sinzendorf from Pottersdorf was born to one of the oldest Austrian noble families in Dresden, Germany. Dresden, of course, is in Saxony, not Austria, but there was a great deal of communication between the two at that time. His father, Georg Ludwig, was a high-ranking minister in the government of the Prince Elector of Saxony. We're talking about the old Holy Roman Empire here. Unfortunately, he was not well and died shortly after Nicholas's birth. His mother, Charlotte Justina von Gersdorf, moved with Nicholas to her parents' home in Gross-Hennersdorf, and four years later married Royal Prussian Field Marshal von Natzmer. His mother moved with her husband to Berlin, and Nicholas remained in Gross-Hennersdorf with his grandmother, Henrietta Katerina, an extremely well-educated lady. The household was pious in tone. Not only did they attend Sunday services in the village church, but heard readings from the Bible and the writings of Martin Luther and other spiritual writers. Grandmother led the family in prayer every morning and evening. Nicholas came to regard Jesus as his friend, and he would spend hours in communication with his Savior. At 10 years of age, he enrolled in the Pedagogium in Halle. Here he studied French, Latin, English, as well as poetics. He also studied the typical things of a, a noble uh, men at that time, such as fencing, riding, and horseback riding, and, uh, and uh, dancing. <clears throat> he did well in his studies, although some of his arrangements were less than satisfactory. He eagerly sought to involve others in this life of communion with Jesus. He founded what was eventually to become known as the Order of the Mustard Seed, and this involved many individuals who were going to become influential. He studied under August Hermann Franke at Halle University, a leading figure in the First Great Awakening, which emphasized personal piety and commitment to Christ. In 1716, he entered Wittenberg University to study law. His uncle and guardian, Field Commander Otto von Christendorf, Sinzendorf, wanted to prepare him for a career in the civil service just as his father had done, as mentioned earlier. Nicholas would have preferred to remain in Halle, which was the stronghold of pietism and pietistic thought in Germany at that time, but he obeyed his uncle's wishes and moved to Wittenberg to study law. Theology would have been the subject he would have liked most to have studied. And at uh, Wittenberg, he was not even allowed to attend the theology lectures because at that time, and still to this day in some German universities, you can only attend certain events if you're actually an enrolled student in those events. So he then conducted theological seminars on people's personal relationship to Jesus in his home. And he befriended the lecturers in theology to hear from them their views on different issues. In 1791, he finished his studies and embarked on a European tour. This, again, is a typical aspect of the life of a young nobleman at that time. In Dusseldorf, he saw a painting, Ecce Homo, by Domenico Fetti, which made a vivid impression on him. He traveled through the lowlands and met many important people. He spent a half a year in Paris and became friends with Archbishop of Paris, Cardinal Louis Antoine de Noé. Upon returning to Dresden, he began his work as an attorney general for the state, but his heart was elsewhere. Sunday afternoons, he held an open lecture uh, in his home where discussion was open to all sorts of religious themes. He published his views. In, uh, under the pen name of the Dresdener Socrates and exercised sharp criticism of his church and its clergy. 
He left government and brought, a run, brought down a rundown estate near Bertelsdorf, which he rebuilt with an eye on making it into a center for Christian living. He turned an eye to the matter of marriage, knowing that it would be difficult, given his ideals, uh, to find a suitable match. Fortunately, he found the right person in the sister of one of his friends, Ertmut Dorothea von Reuss, a power, pious and devoted woman who was anxious for the opportunity to promote the gospel. With some friends, he formed the band of four brothers with the purpose of uniting evangelicals, Lutherans, and Catholics in the love of the crucified Christ and working together for the conversion of Jews and heathens. He accepted refugees from Monrovia to settle on his lands in a settlement which would become known as Hernhut, meaning under the Lord's protection. It became a focus for discontented peasants, and Sinzendorf began to become concerned about the laws which required peasants to serve on their master's lands. He began to question newcomers closely to determine the motivations for their requests and to establish regimes of religious devotion to characterize the community as a Christian congregation. Herrenhut began with a few houses and by the end of his lifetime encompassed hundreds of th houses and thousands of residents. A large hall accommodated events and activities. Every day began with a love feast modeled on the agape of apostolic times. The community provided the food and they all ate and drank alike. Following the example of Jesus, the elders would wash the congregation's feet. Every evening, the congregation would gather for hymns and prayers. Sinzendorf loved singing and wrote over 2,000 hymns, many of which are still sung today. The entire community was divided into choirs, boys, girls, single men, single women, married people, children, widows, and widowers. Each choir had a period in Jesus' life as a model. For example, the child Jesus for the children, the grown Jesus for the single men, and so forth. Adult males were members of, all adult males, were members of the Congregational Council. Both Lutherans and Moravians circulated through the community without any distinction. Every morning, an elder of the community would visit every house to see that everything was proceeding according to plan. Each day, everyone would receive a short quote from the scripture on a slip of paper and would be expected to meditate on that scripture and to enact it in his or her daily life. This practice became widely spread and is still a popular religious devotion to this day. In European towns of that time, there was a great night, there was a night watch which patrolled the community to make sure that all lights were extinguished, that no fires broke out, and that no criminals were afoot. To this, Sinzendorf added a prayer corps, which would offer prayers throughout the night so that the praying never stopped. This community of prayer in Hernhut was to commemorate over a hundred years of continuous prayer before events interrupted the ritual well into the 19th century. In 1738, Sinzendorf established a neighboring community, Hernhock, on lands under the proprietorship of Count Isenberg. This was a more artistic and cosmopolitan community than Herrenhut. In 1736, alarmed Saxon nobles lodged complaints against him with the government in Dresden. After a number of investigations, it was decided that he was a menace to the established order and he was banned from Saxony. Appeals to higher authorities brought some temporary relief, but finally he had no choice but to leave. He relocated his activities to London and visited Copenhagen, where he met a Negro from the Danish colony of St. Thomas, who told him that he had found Christ and that he had a sister on St. Thomas and he knew that she would accept Christ too if only someone would go there and tell her about Christ. So Sinzendorf sent missionaries to St. Thomas to reach out to this woman and other people like her. He also sent missionaries to Greenland, to the Inuit, and to the Sami people in Lapland. 
Having lost his property management rights uh, as, after being banished from Saxony and resigned his government position in the government at Dresden, Sinzendorf was now in a position to evaluate the direction of his life. In 1737, after a number of negotiations, King Friedrich Wilhelm I sanctioned Sinzendorf's ordination as a bishop of the Moravian Church. This gave him the license he needed to proselytize in Danish and English colonies. He visited Amsterdam and held popular seminars and synods on one's relationship to the savior. He negotiated with the Dutch authorities to send missionaries to Suriname, Guyana, Ceylon, and South Africa. He also worked with the Dutch to establish in Holland a community on the model of Herrenhut, Herendijk. In 1738, he preached 60 highly acclaimed sermons in Berlin, but interestingly, none of the local clergy would allow him to come into their church. So he preached on street corners and in courtyards wherever people would gather to listen. He traveled to Geneva and speaking and fluent French, he gave advice to the locals as how they could establish communitarian settlements. Sinzendorf's approach differed from others in several ways. He did not emphasize the moral message of Christianity, for he realized that many natives found it insulting. One native her, uh, her, who heard a missionary preach then commented, the missionary said, thou shalt not steal. You think we don't know this already? Instead, Sinzendorf emphasized that Christ had suffered and died for them. This he found more motivational than moralistic perorations. Another difference was that he did not try to, act, uh, to achieve the mass uh, conversion of an entire people or group, but rather worked with individuals. To baptize a few, he felt, would plant the seeds for more in the future. In 1739, he traveled to St. Thomas, as mentioned earlier, where he had sent missionaries and he championed the rights of Negro slaves to full membership in the community of Christ. Before leaving, he had managed to convince the Danish authorities of the virtue of his mission and had gotten all the necessary paperwork uh, for uh, the trip to St. Thomas, the uh, license from the government of Denmark to preach. Uh, so when he arrived in St. Thomas, he asked how the missionaries he had sent were doing. He was told they're locked up in prison. And when he presented to the royal governor his paperwork, the governor immediately ordered the release of the missionaries, although they were in pretty bad shape. The local parents, uh, planters, excuse me, the last meeting was talking about parents. And <laughs> <laughs> the local planters were quite satisfied with the situation as it was and did not welcome anyone diverting their slaves from their hard work in the fields to worship services. Bowing to their wishes, Lutheran pastors ignored the slave population. They were appalled when, after meeting the Negroes, Sinzendorf kissed each of them on the hand, a gesture of respect which slave owners did not appreciate. His message was well received by the slaves and the Negroes, and he left a missionary on the island to baptize and to preach. Thereafter, he visited the other two Danish islands, St. John and St. Uh, Croix, known at that time as Santa Cruz, where he paid respects at the grave of missionaries who had, he had sent but who had not survived their mission. Sinzendorf had made the acquaintance of a Jew, Nunez Dakota, on his return passage from the Caribbean. In Amsterdam, he called upon his congregation to kneel in prayer on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement in the Jewish liturgical calendar. He preached to the Jews in Amsterdam and Seist. They loved him. He was so eloquent and so knowledgeable. They called him Rabbi Samuel, but he didn't make many conversions. His most lengthy and extensive mission was to the English colony of Pennsylvania and the Indian lands to the west. For preparation for this journey, he traveled across the ocean and his missionary work would preoccupy him from 1741 to 1743. Having learned about bureaucracy, he obtained permission from the authorities in London to preach before leaving London. So he's learning how to work the system. He arrived in Philadelphia and rented a house where he welcomed all. 
Members of the Lutheran Confession found his preachings and hymns conformed to the Lutheran Catechism. He conducted his conduct of Palm Sunday services and the Lord's Supper deeply impressed the congregation. At the same time, a cacophony of accusations and slanders were raised against him uh, by his detractors, uh, but his uh, dignified manner and strength of character was such that he was able to overcome them. They invited him to be their pastor. His Philadelphia sermons went into print and are considered to be some of the finest examples of religious oratory of that time. Philadelphia was one of the few places where strict religious regimes were not imposed upon the people. Dozens of different denominations were active, including a large segment of the population which embraced no religion at all. He visited a group of settlers from Hanhut on the Lehigh River to celebrate Christmas. Given the primitive state of conditions in that area at this time, this celebration was held in a shed. They approached Sinsendorf, and he worked with them to found a communitarian community on the model of Herrnhut that they called Bethlehem, today known as Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He settled in Bethlehem, and from there he preached to the unchurched Germans and the Native Americans. He made many forays into the wilderness to meet the latter. These were difficult journeys on foot, since the wilderness did not contain enough fodder for horses. Needless to say, they were all so dangerous, owing to numerous conflicts in progress between the Iroquois and English settlers, where one never quite knew where one might stand in a moment of conflict. Sinsendorf attracted the attention of the Iroquois High Chief of the Iroquois Federation, and the High Chief decided he would like to meet with Sinsendorf and get to know this man. And needless to say, an invitation like this was something you just could not refuse. So traveling with a small party of guides and interpreters and his daughter, Benigna, he moved through the wilderness to the village of Shikomeko uh, in the Hudson Valley. It's still there to this day. He got along very well with the ch high chief. And the high chief took an embroidered band, cut it in half, wrapped half of it around his right arm, and the other half around Sinsendorf's right arm. This way, everyone would know that they were friends. He, Benigna, and the rest of the party lived in a long house, which he described as the best house he had ever lived in in his life. The long house was such an integral part of Iroquois life that they named themselves the people of the long house in their own language. Life in the long house was a communitarian affair. Two families shared each hearth and dozen families or so each house. When there was, was a domestic argument, uh, the husband was the one to leave. Sinsendorf and his party would have uh, to fit, had to fit into this lifestyle in order to coexist with the natives during his uh, visit to uh, the uh, high chief. Uh, that Sinsendorf had such high praise for the longhouse tells you something about his communitarian ideas. Sinsendorf, along with other Moravians, was able to establish the first Native American Christian community in Shikomiko. This was also unusual in that these conversions occurred voluntarily, not as a result of subjugation. Moreover, he acquired an agreement from the Iroquois that Christianity was not a threat to their culture and that baptized members could be good members of the tribal council and be in good standing. Leaving David Seisberger to continue his work, Sinsendorf traveled back to Germany via Philadelphia, London, and Holland. Upon his return to Germany, he found the affair, that affairs had drifted away from his ideals. In his absence, the communitarian settlement in Herrenhag had reached an agreement with Count Isenberg to function under the jurisdiction of the Moravian church rather than that of the local clergy. Although himself a Moravian bishop, Sinzendorf did not approve of this arrangement because he considered it divisive. It was against all the spirit of what he was teaching. Also in Herrenhag, life was had a decidedly uh, more fun and uh, party tone. It was the party place to be. Uh, 
event in Hernhut. Festivities were common and morals rather loose. Erdmund Dorothea, his wife, spotted this danger, but Sinzendorf did not see it as well. When the locals refused finally to swear an oath of loyalty to the Count of Büdingen, he ordered the community shut down in the course of three years. As mentioned earlier, Sinzendorf was expelled from Herrenhut, and at this point, Count Isenberg actually shut Herrenhock down. This meant that residents always needed some place to go. Missionary activity was integrally linked to the communitarian settlements, and in that event, uh, if a settlement should fail, they would have someplace else to go. In 1749, Saxony lifted its ban on Sinzendorf as the local nobility came to realize that he had solutions for pressing social problems that they just did not have. At this time, Thomas Penn granted him over 100,000 acres, which were going to result in thriving Moravian communities in Pennsylvania and South Carolina. Immediately upon his return to Germany, Sinzendorf set up house with Anna Nitschmann and a number of other women, sidelining relations with his first wife, Ertmut Dorothea. These complex marital relationships would endure until his death in 1760. This will be the subject of section three of this presentation. Nicholas said, as his end was approaching, I have done for the Lord Jesus all that I can. He does not need me here anymore. As he was laid to rest, a tearful Anna Nitschmann, herself on her deathbed, was carried to the window so that she could watch his burial. 2,000 people accompanied his coffin from the church in Bertelsdorf to the cemetery in Herrnhut, where an estimated 5,000 people gathered finally to say goodbye to their wonderful count. Although some of the Count's theological ideas have come up in his biography, his ideas are distinctive enough to need this section too to complete the picture. As mentioned earlier, Nicholas developed a relationship with Jesus as his brother, and he would entrust all things to Jesus in prayer. This theme of brotherhood with Jesus developed throughout his life. Since Jesus is our brother, then all men are our brothers. It does not matter if one is black or white, free or slave, rich or poor, Protestant or Catholic. Brotherhood in Christ transcends all of those differences. There were many with entrenched economic interests who were bitterly opposed to his ideas and efforts. The slave owners did not welcome his liberating message of the gospel reaching their slaves. Many of the clergy had devoted their careers to sectarian squabbling and did not welcome his message that this was unimportant. The nobility, who were dependent on feudal relationships with their peasants, did not welcome his liberating message to the peasantry. He was greeted at every turn by resentment and anger and had to adapt defensive tactics and postures in order to survive. The vast tome of his works over six volumes in length, and I've seen these at the New York Public Library, it's a stack of books from here to here, resulted as, in some extent as a defensive measure against these constant calumnies. As soon as he had preached a sermon, it went down to print and went into the papers and was published. This, you can see exactly what he said. He said, he said, he said, no, this is what he said. Practice, not policy. Uh, the sufferings of Christ provided the next clue in his theological arsenal. Jesus went through his passion and death for all of us, not just a select few. Therefore, when we meditate on his suffering, we find the tools needed to overcome all racial, social, class, and sectarian divisions. His sufferings would also provide the key to converting the heathen to Christ. This was not just another deity. This was a God who cared enough about you to suffer and to die for you. Practice, not policy, was the salient principle. It was important to perform Christian acts and to live a Christian life, not to quibble over theological differences. All could agree on the practice of a Christian life, and there was no reason for disagreement and dissension. Much sectarian discord 
We resolve then as now over the nature of the Lord's Supper, <coughs> the sacrament, or the Eucharist. To Sinzendorf, all these arguments were a distraction. What mattered was the community's spiritual preparation for the sacrament, the meditation, prayer, and fasting leading to the joyous celebration of Christ's body and blood was what mattered, and all of these confessional disputes over the nature of the sacrament were irrelevant. Marriage became for Sinzendorf a religion where the man is the representative of Christ, a priest and a savior who would build with his wife a household church. He would be for his wife her angel, her servant, and the upholder of her blessedness. In the congregation, festive sacramental blessings and joy of sexuality should be experienced. This contrasted to the generally negative view of sex prevalent at that time, which basically looked at sex as being evil but necessary for procreation. Particularly, life in Herrenhag became more and more festive and the morals more and more loose, contributing to its downfall. He envisioned the Holy Trinity in a radical way, but one that also had ancient roots. Two languages, the two languages of the Bible are Hebrew and Greek. In Hebrew, the word for spirit is feminine. In Greek, it is neutral. So Sinsendorf saw the Holy Trinity as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Mother. This, of course, works into much of Brigham Young's ideas and so on. Uh, he called this the primordial community, the original family. From it stemmed baptism, marriage, and family life. Also, he maintained that this vision of the Trinity was much more explainable to aboriginal peoples than the more traditional teachings of the Holy Spirit that were circulating at that time. Although I mentioned something of the <clears throat> complex marital relationships in his biography, the details require a final section three where I will elucidate the evolving and sometimes contradictory scholarship on this matter. Bishop August Gottlieb Spannenberg, a confidant of Sinzendorf and author of an extensive tell-all biography on him, published just 10 years after Sinzendorf's death, recounts that there was a great deal of work to be done at Herrenhut. Correspondence, community affairs, travel plans, missionary work, sermons, and so forth. And that he needed a great deal of help. As mentioned earlier, his son Christian Renatus was one of his closest aides until his untimely death. Thereafter, his closest aides became Anna Maria Lavachin, Anna Nitschmann, and Anna Johanna Pieschen. Spannenberg very specifically notes that these were very young women and pointedly asks, why did Sinzendorf not avail himself of the assistance of older and more experienced members of the community? He very precisely accounts how they were always by his side unless occupied in some other official duties when he was at work when he was at, in traveling, and when he was at home as well. We need to remember that Spanningberg was a Moravian bishop and a close a, a friend of Sinzendorf. He knew that many of the readers of his biography would be members of his church, looking for edifying material on their blessed count. And he pulls his punches very carefully in what he says. And he leaves it up to the discerning reader uh, to look between the lines and to figure out what may have been going on. In his 1997 biography of the Countess, Countess Erdmut Dorothea, Sinzendorf's wife, Peter Zimmerling writes that Sinzendorf was unparalleled in promoting women to important positions in the church Women occupied about a dozen different offices in the church, which were entirely overseen by women, i.e. not a male figure heading things and then the woman do the work. It was entirely managed by the woman. Further, women were able to arise to every ecclesiastical office, priesthood, presbytership, and so on, except 
is up to Bishop. There's questions about that, but we can go into that later. This situation led to quite some conflict with the more traditionally minded Lutheran clergy at the time. Although Sinzendorf's thinking on the subject is not uniform throughout his lifetime, certainly he was well ahead of his time with regard to gender equality. However, there are those who paint a darker picture of this situation. Erika Geiger writes in her 2001 biography of Countess Ertmut Dorothea that Sinzendorf considered his marriage to Ertmut Dorothea to be on rock solid ground. It was a marriage with a mission, building the kingdom of God. The two occupied very different niches in this kingdom, however. He and his ladies covered the spiritual and inspirational matters and she the financial and administrative ones. I haven't really mentioned much in this report how Ertmut is the brains behind this operation in many ways. Uh, it would have gone too long. He and his ladies, yes, each of these had their own circles of aides and advisors. Even when they traveled to the same destination, they would travel in separate coaches. He in his coach with his ladies, and she in her coach with her aides. They would arrive at separate destinations where they would disembark and set up separate households. Apparently, the Count harbored a rather communitarian view of marriage as being whatever relationships worked to serve the community. In her 2014 biography of the Countess, Aini Teufel makes extensive use of Erdmuth's diaries and provides further relevant details. Sinzendorf named Anna Nitschmann mother of the congregation and sat her next to him ahead of Erdmuth Dorothea at services. This did not please the countess, who must have suspected that something was going on. Erdmuth found herself no longer included in important discussions. Sinzendorf did not approve of erotic relationships between members of the community, but on the other hand, he described his marriage to Erdmut as being a religious project in German, and this is the only German I'm going to use, eine religiöse Arbeitsgemeinschaft, a religious project. With this in mind, Nicholas Ludwig's relations with Anna Nitschmann may be seen in a very different light from that of the official record. In 1737, he noticed that the young woman was deeply attracted to him even though he was 15 years her elder. He approached her father, David Nitschmann, to adopt her as his daughter so as to be able to pursue a spiritual relationship. As early as 1743, the Count made it clear to Anna his marital intentions. When Nicholas arrived in Herrnhut, to visit the ailing Erdmut Dorothea in 1755. He arrived with his full entourage of household companions and apostles. And he took up residence in Bertelsdorf, uh, uh, Bertelsdorf uh, Castle, and she in the Herrenhut Manor. This was a frank recognition of how far their lives had grown apart in this time. Anna and Nicholas's relationship was complicated further by the fact that she was, he was a count and she was a commoner. Marriages between nobility and commoners were strongly discouraged, so their marriage was a very low key and out of public sight affair. In all probability, it was simply a recognition of what had been going on for some time. Note that the information on Sinzendorf's marital arrangements comes closer to spiritual wifery the further one gets away from the count. His early and contemporary biographers are men writing biographies about a man. But later, women scholars begin to write biographies about his wife, a woman, and they see things differently. Women's studies have changed how we look at history. And <clears throat> at this point, uh, it has given us an entirely new dimension to look at in terms of the life of Sinzendorf. Given the information above, one may conclude that there are clear indications 
that Nicholas Ludwig may have been involved with as many as four women as spiritual wives from 1743 to 1755. We have little uh, detail on the degree of intimacy in these relationships, but also, uh, in comparison, we also have very little on the degree of intimacy in the relationships of Joseph Smith with some of his uh, plural and spiritual wives. So this is not at all an unusual situation. At the beginning, at the beginning of his great tome on Nicholas Ludwig, Spannenberg promises to present an impartial account. He recognizes that there were many lies about the count, and he affirms that he will tell what is false as false, what is true as true, and that he will tell the good as well as the bad. Certainly, by all accounts, the good far outweighs the bad. Long before the rise of modern social thinkers, he established communitarian settlements which effectively addressed the problems of poverty. He treated all men as equals. He showed no discrimination based on race, color, or creed. He was a pioneer in ecumenicism, racial equality, social justice, gender parity, and human rights at a time when these concepts were hardly known. His projects involved tens of thousands of people, and his ideas are still active in the world today. He revived the failing Moravian church, and today this religious community, headquartered in Herrenhut, shown earlier, continues to carry on his work. In many ways, he laid the seeds for what was going to be on to become, what we today know of as liberal democracy with its social safety net. Over, over 100 years after Sinsendorf, Another charismatic figure would arise in the United States, Joseph Smith, Jr. There are stark differences between the two. Nicholas was rich, highly educated, and very much an old world figure. And Joseph was poor, self-taught, and a frontier figure. However, the similarities are legion. Both reached out to Jews and Native Americans, carried on missionary activity addressed issues of poverty with communitarian living, were charismatic figures and gifted writers, and envisioned the Trinity in different ways. They empowered women, had difficulties with the authorities, were busy building the kingdom of God, and both re-envisioned marriage. What direct connections may lie between Sinsendorf's work and the work of the prophet must remain a matter of speculation, especially since Joseph's diaries would read typically uh, something like I read and wrote all day. We, he gives us very little information on specifically what he was reading. We know, however, that he was fascinated with German language and culture and would write in his diaries, recited German all day. Uh, now, at this time, with the thriving Moravian communities in uh, the, the area of Bethlehem and so on, which is very close uh, to where the prophet is living for many years. It is very reasonable to assert that there were certainly many volumes of uh, Sinsendorf's uh, works circulating at that time, his hymns, his sermons, and, and so on. And that Joseph, especially with this particular interest in German language and culture, may very well have been aware of them. Uh, <clears throat> there further was a great affinity between the first Great Awakening, where Sinsendorf was uh, involved, and the second Great Awakening, where Joseph Smith was involved. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that the ideals of inclusiveness, equality, and outreach, which characterize both religions have some common roots. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kassenbrock, for those interesting, um, especially that last little jab there at the end about the influence on I, Joseph. I, I'm very, um, I, as we proceed, um, I'd like to know if there are any of you have questions. If you do, 
consider, please, the um, digital audience. Come up to the microphone and just introduce yourselves and state your questions so that it can be heard um, in the archive recordings that go on into the future. I wonder, Dr. Kassenbrock, if you might explain just in a, a little bit more detail than you did in the presentation why we haven't heard of Zinzendorf, if his ideas, the idea of liberal democracy with a safety net, which obviously was very influential, um, uh, since his ideas are so radical and so important, why don't we know about him? Mm -hmm. Yes, an excellent question. And let me go to the last part of it first. Uh, the, the social safety, social net, liberal democracy, and so on, and uh, say that these things were very slow to evolve. Uh, in the world of Sinsendorf in the early 17th century, so far as I know, there were really only two countries that had a functioning parliament, Great Britain and Denmark. And there was a great deal of function of a conflict often between the monarch and the parliament. So they were very slowly evolving. And there is, for instance, the rise of the office of the British prime minister uh, to become effectively the head of, uh, of, of government matters took hundreds of years in England. So these things are moving along very slowly and it involved the work of many different people, uh, and uh, Sinsendorf is a part of that. But also in the United States, after World War II, the uh, pogrom against uh, German language and culture, there were book burnings. World War I. World War I, thank you. Thank you, World War I. Book burnings, even lynchings in the most extreme cases. At the end of World War I, 10,000 political prisoners in the United States, people have been locked up for uttering some disagreement with the war effort. And uh, so uh, this had a huge impact on, on the German culture at that time. And much of it was discarded from the history books, and a part of it uh, was Sinsendorf. But there also was different reasons, too. It could have well been that up to this point, much of what was known about Sinsendorf was in the German literature, which was widely spread about through the United States. I have countless works in German that were written in America. All of that disappears. And it didn't integrate that well into the Anglo-Saxon scholarship and, and, and knowledge. And so when that disappears, there's not a backup, there's not a plan B for it. So I, I think that it's a very interesting, very complicated social question of why uh, about a figure as remarkable as this with these ideals of outreach to Negroes, to American Indians, uh, uh, the, the dignity of every person, uh, the goal of eliminating poverty and, uh, and so on, why we know so little about this person. Thank you for the, uh, this really interesting presentation. I'm Bryce. Um, I have quite a few questions, actually, so if I can you know, borrow a bit of the time. Um, what means? <laughs> okay. So initially, I want to ask, um, uh, it, it's very clear that you were drawing upon parallels to the story of Joseph Smith and the early Mormons in comparison to Sinzendorf's uh, communitarian groups uh, that he established in Herr Hut, uh, Herr Hag, um, Herr and Dyke, etc. So, Bethlehem. yes. Uh, so, uh, these communities, I, I found it interesting as well that the Saxon government, um, what we would term as persecution when talking about the Mormon movement, um, that his movements also experienced these things with the Saxon government uh, voting to destroy or to get rid of these communities yeah. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the economic angle of it um, because obviously the, the common refrain is that socialism works only at a small community level. If you try and scope it out, then it falls apart. It's not a sound mm. uh, national uh, economic plan. Um, were there economic influences mm -hmm. that caused the, the communities to uh, kind of fall to pieces and uh, that in addition to the persecution from the Saxon, Saxon government caused them to? A, a fascinating um, uh, question. And I would like to begin with mentioning this is in the era of European colonization and settlement. Basically, the Europeans look at two vast continents, North America and South America, and their wilderness. And, well, we can 
what are we going to do with that? So, oh, your majesty, here's William Penn, a very good man. And he has Quakers who would like to go uh, to the uh, <clears throat> New World in order to escape some of the rigid uh, orthodoxy of the Church of England. Uh, well, would you mind? Oh, I have thousands of acres in the New World. The king could grant land anywhere in his kingdom. So he would grant the land to William Penn and to Thomas Penn. Then their problem is, what do I do with this? So Sinsendorf is an answer to their prayers. Uh, you know, someone with this ready-made uh, uh, idea based on Hernhut. And by the way, Hernhut survives. It even survives Sinsendorf's removal uh, because it was well enough, the game plan was established and it continues to go on to this day. Now, of course, as it did in the 18th century. But the thing is that at this point, this is a working game plan for the settlement. And then it add on to that, and I'll come to the last part of it, add on to that, Germany is filled with poverty. Uh, a cadre of wealthy barons, counts, dukes, and princes preside over a population living in a sandbox. Barely the clothing on their backs and a little hut and some food and storage in the hut. Starvation is a common problem. Going well into the 19th century, I've seen uh, ink prints of peasants at a fair in Munich wearing rags. You can actually see their butt through the back of their pants. They're wearing rags. This is the situation. So here you have this visionary concept of, of communitarian settlements. You have these monarchs with all this land that they, they want to do something with. You have these millions of people looking for some place to go where they could lead a better life. So it's a powerhouse of economic development at that time. And of course, the... Um, uh, the uh, problem is that uh, we can't re re replicate that today, clearly. Um, so uh, I, uh, next question then. Um, uh, in early Mormonism, we had this concept of um, common consent and everybody voting and only things like revelations are, that are adopted once they are voted unanimously to be accepted by the community. Did he have a system of democracy implemented within these communities where people's voices were you know, heard? Good point. Um, and I'd like to however, go back to your first question with something that uh, I just forgot to add. Yeah. This works for Joseph Smith very well, too, 100 years later. Where do his people come from? They come from Germany. They come from Wales. Uh, you know, they're, they, the they're poor, they're poor, and they're looking for a better life. So it continues to work. Okay, going now to your, this question about, um, I'm sorry, the... Uh, uh, voting. Did he oh, have voting, a system yeah. of voting and uh, parliamentary procedure? I, I wouldn't call it a parliamentary procedure. And to be very honest with you, in my research for this paper, um, I, I didn't read a great deal on that. But the fact that they would have congregational councils does suggest that there was, had to have been participation or it wouldn't have mattered to have them. But I don't know a lot about the details. It's a very good question. Okay. Uh, and then third question, uh, probably final question, sorry. Um, uh, not 60 years after his death, Alexis de Tocqueville is touring the United States, writing in his journal, and, and uh, giving his first impressions of interacting with people and uh, visiting various frontier settlements. Did Sinzendorf write his own thoughts of encountering various American frontier settlements. What, what was his kind of impression coming over to the frontier and meeting with the, the Grand Chief? And it, what, what did he think about early, early American frontier? The world that de Tocqueville was going to see um, almost 100 years after Sinsendorf, or was it even more? Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was not more than 100 years, but close to 100 years after. Uh, was a, a very different world than the one that Sinsendorf was go found a hundred years before. Much more settled. Uh, much many issues had been settled out. For instance, the Indian village of Shikamiko, which I mentioned here a couple of times, is still there today, but it's not an Indian village anymore. It wasn't an Indian village within ten years of the time that they established a Christian community there. The white settlers in the Hudson Valley were so outraged at a, an Indian village that they went to the governor of, the royal governor of New York, and they asked for a permit to shoot the Indians. Thank God he declined. He didn't want to start an Indian war because they could shoot back. But it, there was just so much hostility uh, that um, 
it was it was a whole situation characterized by very different um, uh, geopol uh, social, political, and economic circumstances. De Tocqueville arrives at a fairly settled agricultural community. That was not at all the case the almost 100 years earlier at the time of Sinzendorf. Oh, OK. Not that I know of. And I, I know one of the things, the question is, did Sinzendorf write about the social circumstances he saw in America? That's an excellent question. Um, I have had access to the six volumes plus of his works, and most of them are sermons and uh, <clears throat> hymns, many hymns, poems, and, uh, and philosophical treaties. And um, I did not see very much in the way of, uh, of uh, social comment in them. But that's, that's not to be a definitive answer by any means. It's just where I'm at this, at this point. Uh, to be very frank, I spent about six months intensively working on this project under conditions where, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, you couldn't have regular access to libraries and so on. It was a miracle I got as much as I did. Oops, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, <laughs> that I got as much material as I did was really amazing. Uh, uh, but uh, I would like to know more, and, uh, but I just haven't read enough to know that yet. Uh, you mentioned a couple times Joseph Smith's uh, interest in German language and culture. <laughs> I'm familiar with his study of German and the journal entries about that uh, and uh, his use of German language in sermons. But uh, please share what you have in mind when you talk about Joseph Smith's interest in German culture. Uh, I, I mean it as a... Um, okay. Yes, actually, there's some specifics which go to that very well. Uh, so far as I have come across, Smith never mentioned Sinzendorf. But as I say, he's not a systematic scholar uh, you know, who will write down, I read you know, such and such today, and the next day I read such and such. But he talks about Luther's translation of the Bible as being one of the most excellent, inspiring, accurate, and true versions of the Bible. And so I think that this, this is giving you a very high mark with regard to German language and culture, that he felt that this great reformer and using the power of the German language had created the most accurate version of the Bible that had been known up to that time. So I think that this was the sense in which uh, he was interested in language and culture. I don't think he was interested in German politics at all. But he was interested, German had at this point, in the language and in the culture, a huge amount of devotional pietistic literature. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, poets such as Claudius, uh, who was a pietist. Uh, he, he wrote the famous uh, lead, De Montes Aufgegangen, and, and so on, and, about, uh, and, and he ends it all. We think about the beauty of the night, the beauty of the moon, and then we think about our sick neighbor next door, too a pietistic tone. And uh, so th this huge body of literature on pietism and, re and religious devotion in German, I think, was what uh, Joseph Smith was uh, somewhat familiar with. Uh, yes, uh, that, the question was, is this romantic? And I, actually, it should be a question. And um, the, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the first great awakening, which I never knew much about until I started to work on this project and I caught up on it. The first great awakening, I, I really didn't realize at first that Sinzendorf was a leading figure in the first great awakening. And it was, they were fed up with the scholastics, the people with an academic answer to everything. And no, no, it has to be this way. And they wanted to see spontaneity. They wanted to see the love of Jesus. They wanted to see Christ in action. And, and this is John Wesley, very much along this line of thinking. Also, many hymns, many sermons. And th this is the first great awakening. And then in the United States, uh, there comes along, excuse me, 
approximately 100 years later, uh, the Second Great Awakening. It's a different political agenda at that point. It, it is an agenda where the impact of the <clears throat> deinstitutionalization of established religions is really beginning to be felt. And the various religious bodies are really now having to attract and seek uh, people and members and participation in a way that they didn't quite have to do uh, before. But once again, with Joseph Smith, the Romantic movement is very close to his soul. You know, uh, he, he rejects the orthodoxy, the rigidity of Campbell uh, Enlightenment approach uh, to Christianity, very much akin to the spirit of what Sinsendorf is saying. And, and not just Sinsendorf, there are other people involved as well. It, it was amazing, yeah. Thank you all very much for being here with us today, and especially to those of you watching online. We're so glad that you joined us for this session, and we'd like to give our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Kassenbrock for his presentation today. Thank you, thank you.